Okay, so you got, uh, you can see I've got a really thick <laughs> slab of, of uh, willow, and this is around 50, 50 millimeters. So um, we're just gonna go into the ba basic arching. Um, you know, what, what, what you should avoid. Um, I could do this in my sleep, you know, and you will too, after just a few instruments, you'll, you'll know exactly what you need to do and you'll, um, uh, your first rule is just, I would advise you to immer etwas schön machen, yeah? Always make something beautiful. You, you always want to take the shape, you always want to make the shape of the arch that you want. That, you're always working towards that. So, you can see where I started he, on, on this side where it's thinner. So basically my goal is just to get it thin enough to where I can cut it out with the Laubsäge. Uh, uh, in English, I don't know. This one. Uh, the Laubsäge, yeah? <laughs> Coping, uh, coping saw. Cut it with the coping saw. So yeah, you can see that um, um, you can either stand. Th this is not ergonomically a great setup, um, you know. And you do want to take care of your back, and you want to, you know, maybe warm up a little bit, like you're going to exercise, because uh, because this is willow, uh, it's gonna, it's going nice and nice and smooth, you know. You have a lot of control. But like I say, you can, you could, uh, you'll be able to do this in your sleep. I can talk to you. I can have poetic thoughts, uh, daydream. You know, as long as you're keeping an eye on what you're doing. And the basic rule is that you want to think about your lowest points and your highest point. Your highest point is where the bridge is. Oh uh, yeah. So. Um, I don't know if you can see, yeah, you can't really see in the photo, but there's a little, this doesn't look very violin-like, right, this part, so, so I'm removing that. But what I'm also doing is I'm working the whole section at once, you know. I'm, I'm working, I'm thinking about my edges because the goal is to get this to around, I'd say, 12 or 15, you know, just so you can cut it by hand. Yeah, obviously you could not cut this now, and why would you? So, um, you're working the whole section in relation to the edge. Now, this side is a little bit cleaner and more like an, an actual instrument, and this is all kind of lumpy and screwed up. So, so, what I do is I lower here near the edge, a nice sweep, and go all the way to the... Um, I mean, I, so all my training was in German, so I don't know the English words for a lot of this stuff. Uh, where the mond, mond will be. Uh, um, so now, this is actually higher than this, right? So, what do I do? I go here. And you're just, you're trying, you're constantly trying to work both sections simultaneously with this and this. You know, I've got this, you know, almost to where I want it. So then I flip it over and start working on this side. And, um, and you'll see that you start what, start, what happens is that once you get this arch, then you're connecting this with this, right? This isn't really there yet, but I'll show you. So eventually you're coming across and you're you're approaching this side as well, you see? It's kind of hard to get over here, um, so you can just leave it. But you get the basic idea, you know. I'm trying to get everything to be cut out, and when you're working it may be tempting to, to just, oh, I want to, I'm trying to get this to 15, so I'm just going to do this. You know, you see, I'm just going to work this part and get it down. Don't do that. Immer etwas schön machen, yeah? Always do beautiful. Always, see, I don't know if you can see this. This is just ugly, yeah? So, I'm going to fix that. And really, with a slab this thick, I mean, this is nuts. 50 is really high, you know? 
There's no way this instrument, it could, that's the thing, it could be 50 uh, uh, millimeters high. You could have a really fat arched back. That's possible with this plate, you know? So just remember, always do something beautiful and you, you have a memory of what you did here. You want to repeat this exactly. So, uh, and like I say, after a while, you won't even have to think about it. It's just going to make sense because everything is in relation to your lowest point, right? That's what you're trying, you're trying to achieve that. So what you do not want to do, and this is a big mistake, and it usually happens more towards here. Um, so if I don't, I'm probably not going to get there in this video, but what, what I may do is cut, um, cut this, depending on how long we talk. And then I'm going to show you what I mean with the center, because this, this is where you usually get into trouble. Um, because what I've seen the print, I've had many apprentices and they'll start, yeah, I can't really explain it now, but they'll, they'll, they get excited and they, oh, I'm, I'm making the arch and then they'll, they'll go over too soon. You know, I, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm explaining it correctly, but, um, for now you're just trying to, trying to get something clean, beautiful and the same, you know, Bisymmetrical, I guess you could say. Uh, yeah, and you're, you're trying to cut it out, but at the same time, um, you're trying to finish. You know, you're not just trying to cut it out. You're making the instrument. You know, so everything you do now, you know. So, yeah, I got ahead of myself. What you want to avoid, absolutely, is. Especially if you have a thinner piece of wood, because not all slabs are going to be 50. <laughs> like a violin, for example, sometimes you got to make that arch with very, you know, there's no room for a mistake. So what you do not want to do is make this, this part lower than this part. You see what I mean? Because that means that, means that ev you know, everything here has to come down because there's no instrument that let me let me make a, a diagram that maybe that's the best way do you understand what i mean tom yeah yeah you understand what i mean okay yes i do okay um let's just make a Yeah, obviously when the, when the highest point is lower than everything else can be. Right, yeah, if the, you know, because you're making, a, you're making an arch, you know, and the reason you're making an arch is because for strength. You know, the higher the arch, the, the stronger it's going to be, you know what I mean? If you, have a, if you had a very flat arch and you had a lot of pressure, um, there's a chance that it would, <laughs> you know, I mean, you, there's not a chance, but it's, it's not as strong, you know, something flat, and this is why viola de gambas with flat backs have braces on the inside, or guitars for that matter. Acoustic guitars have braces, you know, because you know a flat, thin back is not strong. So yeah, what you you know you understand that, and that becomes very crucial. Um, you know, the closer you get. So where, let's say that you're almost done. You got your purfling done, and all of a sudden you take this big gouge cut. You know. That means that everything has to come down and your whole plan, you know, is ruined because you cannot have a, a, an arch, you know, that's going like this and then all of a sudden, you know, this lump, everything has to come down, you see. So that becomes more crucial um, towards the, the, the middle when you're doing the sea bots. And then another rule is you do that last. You see how I've come in here like, I'm going to get this, uh, there's no problem to do your corners. Um, as, a, as a general rule, I don't, but, um, you know, I, I'm just trying to get to where I can cut it out. I'm really, I mean, I'm kind of shaping the arch, but, you know, like I say, I'm doing this in my sleep, so I'm really not really thinking about it at this point. You know? can, you, can you turn the camera more towards you? Yeah. Like that? Right. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, so... Well, I'll do some of the center and I'll kind of explain it. Um, 
It actually makes sense. Yeah, I get it. I mean, uh, you get it. it makes yeah. Sense, uh, what do you do? Yeah. So makers get into trouble um, when they're doing the center arch, and they create. They they sort of come in, and then they want they they want to make it too fast, and then they. Yeah, I think the best way to explain it is to flip it. So I'm going to go ahead and flip it and do the other side because I already have the um. Um, is the bottom uh, uh here's wood, another that the, sorry go ahead what's the the piece of wood underneath is that the oh that's just to give me some height yeah like i said this is not ergonomically um perfect you know okay jose made this thing where he he has a, actually the instrument the back in a cradle and he's standing up and he can tilt it at whatever angle he wants and you can actually buy these um but I've been doing, you know, I'm fine with this for now. I'm totally fine, you know, with just clamping it, you know. And it's also, um, when you're standing like this, it's really good exercise for your legs and your um, abdomen and your ass, <laughs> your butt. You know, like you're... Because <laughs> uh, I'm usually standing. When I do, when I do the, the, um, the middle, the sea bouts, uh, I'm always, I'm always sitting. So yeah, I can show you this. So let's pretend that all of this is, is, all of this has been, has been cut out and I'm doing my sort of final seabout, right? You can see what I've done here. This doesn't look like a violin at all. Can you see the arch at all? I mean, you can kind of see well, this. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, this. Okay, so this up. is what you yeah, want to do, right? You, you want to push and you want to always try to maintain this is the highest point. That, that I've already explained. So you're going up. Like you, 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 you see you're your scoop, you're sort of, point. yeah, and a general rule is, you know, when, when you take your gouge and you're going to take the highest point because not only is it easier to carve, you're not going to, because you, you cannot carve with the gouge, with all points of the gouge touching the wood at once. It won't go. You'll, you'll get a catch, you know, it'll just catch. So you do one scoop there, and now you've got a, you know, you, you made this U-shape with your gouge, so now you're gonna take the high point, right? And what you wanna do is you wanna push up to where, to where the, the um, you're, uh, how to explain? I think you already understand. To where the, the high, you're pushing it up to where you're re retaining yeah, the, the maximum point. amount of height possible. You see what I mean? Because of course I'm going to make it lower, right? Yeah. So now I don't know if you can see. Now I've got this kind of dip, so I can come here and do this. Mm -hmm. Right? Come down. Can you see clearly? Yeah, it's like, it's, yeah, it's like the. It looks like the body contour on a on a strat on the back of the strat. Yeah, sure. This yeah. this is starting to look yeah. very uh, cello like, right? So come in yeah. here. You know, obviously the rule. This is lower. This is higher. So the mistake that makers make is that they're making an arching and they keep going. They go up here. They go up here, right? And they start rounding it. No, don't do that, right? First, you wanna you wanna make one. You want to push up to where you're retaining the maximum. See, now you'll see. See how high the sea the is? And see how low this is? Yeah, so you, yeah, I you're pushing it you up, you know, you're sort of gouging. Any, any height, you know? Uh, you sorry, know. repeat that? Yeah. You understand. As long as you understand, you don't need to, re you know. Yeah. So. Right? So around the middle, your, uh, your, your, your cutting direction is basically generally going to go... No, I should have a pencil at all times. This is ridiculous. Um, your cutting direction is basically going to go this way. Around here, it's kind of iffy. You need to be careful, especially when you're very low. Because there almost is no, if you try to go this way, this is working because it's slap cut. Oops. Uh, 
your cutting direction is going to be this way in general, right? Around here, it's kind of iffy. You have to be careful because it can split. And then it's going to go this way, right? This way. And around here, the same thing happens. This way. Be careful. This way. You'll, you'll discover this when you start carving. It, it will become self-evident, you know? Same thing here. This way. This way. Be careful. <laughs> and this way. Does that make sense? So, yeah, I mean, because this is 50 or 55, I don't know, this is a, a nice big slab of wood. Always pushing up towards the center. Oh. Yeah, see, it doesn't want to cut that way, right? That's because the direction is this way. All right? So, that looks ugly, right? I mean, look at what I got going on. I got wonk, wonk, wonk. I mean, don't do that. <laughs> so now I'm going to clean all that up. And you can stand back. And actually, this kind of light is perfect. Um, especially when you're when you're doing when you're when your purfling is already inlaid, and you're down to making the final arching. Um, you really want to do this slowly and carefully, you know. You're actually, you'll be doing it with the thumb plane. So now I'm going to clean this up. Pushing my highest point. All right. And the reason this light is good is because you see the shadows and um, if you don't happen to have a workshop that is full of natural sunlight, <laughs> then you can use a lamp and you put it at a low angle and that makes a shadow so you can see, uh, you can see uh, what the heck you're doing, you know. So. Yeah, this still looks really, really fayissimo. <laughs> yeah, and also I need to secure this, this plate because it's sliding all around. All right, um, here's another really good tip, man. Is You see all this, all, I don't know if you can see, but on my bench are all of these shavings. Um, when you feel a little bit winded, and um, this is, when you feel, you know, you're going to get, it's, you can't carve forever. You need to take little breaks and drink water and, you know, but w whenever you take a little break, uh, you want to clean up your shavings. And I'll tell you why. It's because your tools love to, love to go in the dustpan, especially the scrapers. You may think, oh, you know, I'm just going to keep going. I don't feel like cleaning up. Um... And lo, and lo and behold, the next day, you'll be like, where is that scraper? And you know what happened? It was here, and you didn't realize it. And you whooshed it into the dustpan, and you put it in the trash. And I can tell you, that happened to me once. Uh, my Ibex, my favorite Ibex plane, I realized the next day it was in the trash. And I, I, I was almost weeping, because it was sentimental. I had it for over, this was, this was in Vienna. A long time, 10 years, over 12 years ago. So it was in Sammy's trash, you know. So I thought about going out, going out and looking, digging through the trash and finding this, this plane, you know. Um, and I had a, an apprentice here who, um, I had this really sentimental scraper. I know this sounds totally depot, but I had this scraper that the, the Hungarian maker gave to me when I was studying under him and He's like, oh, you, this is such a great scraper for everything. And I kept it sharp and I loved it. It was like a symbol of, um, and I had this guy came in and he lost my scraper. And it, I mean, it can happen to anyone. So it's not his fault, but that's why you clean up because your tools, the scrapers especially, 
they love to get in here, you know. <laughs> so, um, let me secure this better because it's, um, and I'm going to stop on the center, although that, that still looks butt ugly. I'm going <clears> to, <throat> the rule is generally you move, you're going to do all of this as a section, right? Eventually you're c connecting across here. You know, this is coming lower, and then you have everything nice and symmetrical. Uh, if you want to get um, really picky about it, you can flip the, you can uh, remove the plate uh, and take your, your calipers and measure here and measure here. If you, but really at this point, you, you have no business doing that, you know, because, um, um, you know, it's 50. I mean, I got plenty of, plenty of, uh, same thing with this one. And I love big slabs. And the, the reason for that is it's more work, but you have more choices. You can change your mind. You can say, you know what? I don't want this to be so high, or I'm going to do this sort of nice sweep and scoop at the end. And, you know, for tonal reasons, well, for both aesthetic and both for tonal reasons. Um, uh, you know what I mean? So I need more um, of, this, uh, of this stuff. Great stuff. This non-slip. Uh... Mm -hmm. Actually, Ryan, Ryan, Gall Ryan Gallagher, the great uh, Canadian uh, maker, Canadian New Jersey maker, highly recommend his S instruments if anyone is watching. <laughs> I don't think anyone's going to watch these videos anyway, but... Um, uh, this is a historic piece from the years of Ryan uh, studying here. So uh, there should be another one is the thing. All right, so you kind of understand all of that, you know. I think maybe um, while I'm working you can watch and um, the, people, the people in TV land can turn it off if they're bored. I think maybe we could talk about wood selection, like, uh, you know, why would you choose this, you know, over maple or whatnot. Um, so, so no, no scrapers are in, in my trash, hopefully. Um, a good point to make. All right, let's say that you're, let's say that you're, you're at the tone wood, uh, you're at Saxe and Mariazell, or you're, you went all the way to, to Munich and you're with Parler and you're, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna buy a buttload of tone wood, you know, you're just gonna spend all your money and, and, you know, a good thing to do is, um, if you see wood, that is reasonably priced and has good tonal qualities, my advice to you is buy it all, you know? <laughs> and a lot of island makers will, will like laugh and then they will actually agree because, <clears throat> um, well, for one thing, you notice the price of wood has gone up, right? I mean, forget about price, just because, uh, you'll never have the chance to buy that wood again, and you will regret it for the rest of your life. <laughs> I remember um, me and Mikey went to uh, Kreutzer. This is uh, this is near Pollar Kreutzer, and he had um, he's such a cool guy. Unfortunately, he's no longer in business, but he had sets. It was like five euros for a complete set of Muschelahorn. With the neck block, the ribs, and I mean just the hardwood, you know, you'd have to buy your top separately, obviously. But five euros, and the stuff was gorgeous, you know, and all, and it was old. It came from this old Mittenwald uh, factory, right? So, but I had already been to Zach, I had already been to traditional tone wood in Mariazell, and we had already been to Parler. So I had already like, you know, kind of blew my wallet on, um, on all this wood. I mean, the car was full, you know, and Mikey, like, you know, he bought, he bought a lot and, um, 
And I still think about that to this day when I want to make a violin with uh, quilted maple, you know? Like, ah, you know, and then I'm paying like, uh, you know, 50 euros or 40 or 50, 50 euros for a set, you know, for one fiddle. And I thought, man, you know, if I had just bought all that maple from, um, from Kreutzer, then I, you know, I'd be fine. And also just, it's really sentimental. I don't know, I, wood starts to become sentimental. I can't explain it. But, you know, I have pieces of wood from Vienna, like, you know, tw 20 years ago. And I still have them, you know. I mean, I, I don't know. I haven't, the time will come to use them. Um, but, yeah, enough of the, the junk. Um, as a rule, it's, it's always going to be at least four years old. So any, any tone wood seller is, is probably going to age it for four years minimum, you know. Um, and that's really, that's really all you are really worried about now. Now when it comes to spruce, I, I would say older is, is, is usually better. But it's actually a myth that uh, older wood somehow is better. Like this is just rubbish, you know. Well, every wood is different. It's a good thing to remember. Like this is different from this tree, this is different from this tree. You could have a 20 year old piece of spruce that's, that's, that's good or bad, you know what I mean? It's like, I mean, it's good that it's dry because there's, gonna, there's no moisture, you know, the drier it is, in theory, the more it's going to resonate, It'll, you know. But, um, yeah, you can, use, you can use most wood after four years. Um, another misconception is that flamed maple is better, like better quality. This is another garbage thing from the 19th century, and, I, and it's because, I think it's just because it's optically more beautiful. And you'd be shocked that like most, a lot of violin makers, they choose their wood only on optics. And they buy over the internet and they're like, oh wow, that's a good piece of wood. And I'm just like, what? You know, like, not only is flamed maple more difficult to work, it makes your, your tools dull. Well, Willow makes your tools dull, actually. Which is one of the chief complaints that violin makers have about Willow is that it dulls your tools. I'm like, well, everything dulls your tools. You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know, life makes a dull, life dulls your tool, you know? So, you may shut, shut the beep up and, and, and sharpen, you know, sharpen. So, um, yeah, I, if you look on my website, there are like a few instruments with, um, with some flamed maple, but it is not better, you know? And another thing is that the ribs, you know, they'll make the ribs at, um, a lot of times in the corners, the ribs will be one millimeter, and I've seen fiddles with one, one millimeter thick all the way around. To me, that's a little too thin. It makes it really easy to bend. But when, you have, when you're using flamed maple, uh, hold on, the battery's about to die, really? When you're using flamed maple, um, the, you have hard and you have soft points, right? The, the actual flame part is much harder. So in order to, in order to, to thin your ribs, you're going to need it. You, you have to use a tooth plane, you know? This is a, a plane with, um, I don't know if you can see. Looks like a kind of comb, you know, see the teeth. That makes it easier to work. But, um, so that's a misconception, you know. Um, and this, th I think this started, you see these, uh, you see these 20th, these early 20th century books, and they, they criticize the maker and they say, um, he used a poor, poor choice of wood. And I'm looking at the wood, I'm like, there's nothing wrong with that, you know, just because it's not flamed, you know, so. I mean, people have different opinions and, you know, I gotta plug in this phone, if you can still see. Hold on a second. Um, what, what was I getting at? I forgot. <laughs> like, uh, like wood choice. Yeah, 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 wood choice. So, for, for violin, you're, you're working on violins. Um, Yeah, you don't really need to see the arch, do you? Uh, that's, uh, you that's can't. Why I don't know. Like, 
Yeah, hold on. Boy, the sun is just blasting me, you know. But th this light is good for this, you know. So I'll keep. We we'll keep talking for a while. I don't know how long we're going now. Thirty minutes. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, let me just make one last point, though. Um, so, in case you're like going on the internet right now and like, okay, I'm going to take Nate's advice and go. You can't use Willow for vi don't use Willow for violin, you know. Uh, I've never tried it actually, but I think what happens is that it's just too light. You need some grounding. But what's going to happen is you're going to make you're going to make uh, you're going to make your first violin, and hopefully you're going to sell it. Uh, you're going to do a, a terrible varnish, maybe, or maybe you'll do a great varnish, but probably not. And then someone's going to ask you, "Hey, can you make a viola?" And at that point, I think you should think about using Willow for your viola, you know, because number one, it's going to make you different from other makers. Number two, your viola is, it, I mean, your viola is going to sound unique, not just because you use Willow, because you made it and you didn't use arching templates and you, your personality went into it, your heart and your love went into it. So, um, yeah, when you're shopping for tone wood, Consider willow, poplar, and alternative woods for your violas. Uh, uh, and you know what? They're, it's actually cheaper. You know, plain maple sounds better. A lot of most makers will agree. They would prefer to use plain maple, but you know why they don't use it? Because it doesn't sell. So I'm just like, you know what? I'm going to use the wood that I think sounds the best. Right? And I don't care if it sounds like, you know, this richly tiger-striped thing that glimmers in the varnish. People think, wow, that's really great piece of wood. Like, no. <laughs> I mean, it could be. But the chances that optically you're going to get, you know, um, also beautiful and a good sound, you know, if you trust, trust your wood seller, which I do, I trust, I trust Poller 100%, I trust uh, Zach at Traditional Tone Wood, that's traditionaltonewood.ate, and I trust him, uh, then what I do is I just, I say, I want this, I want this, I want this, I need what, and, and Zach sends me the best, you know, always. And there's been some other makers who complain, who say, Nate gets the best wood, <laughs> but I don't know. So, uh, yeah, so we'll, I think we'll just, we'll quit then. And um, uh, tomorrow I'll show you, maybe do the purfling and the sea, sea bouts. So, yavol.